guys, Tom and Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, <laughs> it's a painful time to look back for you, having started the business. Give me a sense of why you decided to put this film together. Hey, everybody. Uh, so, I, as I mentioned, I started this house painting business, but really I was pursuing film. I wasn't pursuing house painting. Uh, I'd say my parents made me save half of every paycheck through high school for college, and when I got there, it wasn't what I expected at all. And so I dropped out of school and used all the money I had to buy a camera uh, and start a film company, but I realized nobody was going to invest in my projects uh, because I didn't have any experience or a track record. And so I basically just started shooting stuff on my own and using this house painting business as a way to fund my projects and give me the flexibility I needed. But obviously I didn't have any idea what was going to happen with all this. Um, but from there, uh, after kind of experiencing it, uh, I decided I wanted to get back into economics a little bit. And so I did a torrent search for just the word economics. And the Mises Institute had put a free audiobook online of Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And uh, that, that really, uh, obviously as you can tell, that substantially influenced me. Um, and it really gave me the idea that we should be asking these people that predicted it why it happened and what's next, because Henry Hazlitt, the, the things he was writing about in the 1940s really described a lot of what we ended up having happen. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of the background, but uh, at, at that point I had the idea to bring on Tom Woods, and he was gracious enough to co-write it. Uh, Gene Epstein had actually told him that if, uh, or he had told him uh, that his book Meltdown should be adapted into a documentary, and Tom said, ah, yeah, like, when am I going to do that? And uh, so when I came to Tom, uh, Gene had already put that idea in his head, and Tom said yes. So here we are uh, eight years later. <laughs> well, we're so glad you are, because this is sort of the best you know, encapsulation of what happened, why it happened, but more importantly, who saw it coming and who did not. I think probably many of you are, are really amazed that we are sitting here with, quite frankly, national treasures people who actually saw it were laughed at, were criticized. And let me start with Peter Schiff. I don't know if a lot of you guys know this, but Peter and I actually went to high school together. Um, and she was my best student. Very <laughs> funny. <laughs> <laughs> Professor. But then we kind of went in separate directions. And years and years later, when did you move to Connecticut from California? 2005. OK, 2005 really getting up to the height of the uh, the crisis, right, to the, the height of the bubble, rather. And Peter comes to town and says, oh, you know, I, I'm here, we should get together. And we sit down at Rue 57, you know, up on in Midtown, and for the next hour, he starts telling me the whole thing is going to implode. The whole system is going to implode subprime mortgages, and Liz, do you know what Alt-A mortgages are? Now, a lot of people were not talking about Alt-A at the time. And I said, no, what are they? And he said, subprime with a better FICA score. <laughs> and he said, if you have any debt that you're owed, pay it off now, because rates are going to reset and it's going to get ugly. I ran home, that was a, two, that was a Saturday lunch, and I ran home and I said to my husband, we have to pay off our home equity line of credit because it's going to reset and it's going to be a mess. And he said, where's this coming from? And I said, Peter Schiff! <laughs> But you saw people laughing at Peter. I'm more interested to know, Peter, how did you know? What was it that you saw in the earliest moments? And go back to California, because you said you were in a building back in Southern California where there were some mortgage guys lending. Well, yeah, you know, when I started my, my broker dealer, um, and I, I rented more office space than I needed, and I was expanding uh, more slowly. During, this is during the dot-com bubble. And uh, so I subleased some of the space, and I was always subleasing it uh, to uh, mortgage lenders. And they were always there. Companies would start uh, up and they would need some space. And I was able to overhear uh, the mortgage brokers, how they were getting people to take out loans and doctoring up their, their documents and falsifying them. And they were cold calling them and, oh, I can get you all this cash out. And uh, you could just see the fraud. And it, they were all originating it. Nobody cared. Uh, if any of these loans would ever get repaid. They just needed to originate them so they can turn around and resell them. Okay, but this is one building in Southern California. How did you triangulate it to spread out to the rest of the nation and have confidence that that was actually happening? Well, I, I understand, understood the problem that uh, that was created by, by Greenspan. You know, if Greenspan had not 
dropped interest rates down to 1% the way he did. Um, I think the stock market bubble that popped in 2000, there would have been a lot more downside. I mean, I think the Dow would have gone quite a bit lower than it did. I think the NASDAQ, you know, which went from 5,000 to 1,100, probably would have gone to 500. I mean, it would have been a bigger correction uh, had, had uh, Greenspan not, not done that. But once he did that and started creating the money, I could see where it was going. I could see what was happening in the housing market, and I knew that it was distorting the economy in ways that were much greater than the, the, the dot-com bubble did, because I knew that we were building an entire economy based on home equity and, 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 and home equity extractions, and people were spending money they didn't have and buying stuff they couldn't afford. And so this whole thing was a big bubble, and I could see the way it was being financed. And you know it's only a matter of time until the whole thing implodes. And it just, you know, it took until 2007, but it finally happened. Gene, how did you see uh, the crisis coming? What well, did you notice? <laughs> well, the, the, the housing bubble was palpable. I mean, there, there was uh, no question uh, that if you looked at price indexes, that when you're looking at uh, prices, uh, house prices and price indexes in California, New England, going up by 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 percent, uh, and when uh, the private sector is in being encouraged to issue mortgages with 3, 4 percent down payments, that's what brought them in. So uh, all you had to do was look at that and then recognize, of course, that the, uh, that, that the government was massively encouraging this. Uh, and that's when the private sector uh, came in. I want to mention, uh, ironically, ironically, in a way, the most heroic, uh, the, the gutsiest person who saw this coming was Mike Burry of The Big Short. And uh, what? And, and that movie, uh, The Big Short, uh, which I think is intellectually uh, a, 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 a shame, uh, only about, only depicting uh, the crazy crony capitalists, the casino capitalists who got uh, involved, uh, and not at all depicting the government, because the crowning irony is that if you speak to Mike Burry, he put a lot of money in the line, and he too knew that it was a government-induced housing bubble. That's not what in, that's not in that movie, and it's not in the book. And yet, the, the, Mike Burry, played by Christian Bale very well, in that movie, if he were here, he would be the guy who we'd really respect because he put his money where his mouth is, found a way to short the housing market, and made billions of dollars in the process. But he knew that it was a government-induced bubble. And let me get to yeah. you, Jim. Yeah. What did you see that indicated to you that, and I'm talking years ahead of anybody else. Yeah. Well, um, there's one thing to uh, take away from this. Is you a, little a little bit closer. One thing uh, to take away from this, perhaps, is how long a year can be. Uh, the first quarter, I think, 2001 house prices were up 8%. Uh, the Fed funds rate was on its way down. And uh, it was no secret that house prices, even then, were out of line. Um, by 2003 and 2004, you began to see uh, these crazy mortgage, uh, these kind of mortgage science projects. Uh, collateralized debt obligation compared to the alphabet of uh, mortgage securities. So 2001, count these years, one, two, three, four, saying things as Peter said them and as others said them. But that, on Wall Street, there's this uh, distinction uh, that is almost invisible between being early and wrong. So uh, this has relevance today to see some crazy, I mean, uh, some 13 trillion or so of debt securities worldwide uh, are priced to yield less than nothing. Not after adjustment for inflation, but nothing, nothing, below zero. Uh, the lender pays the borrower. Nothing like this in 4,000 years of interest rate history. So uh, those of us have been decrying this ought to recall that uh, you could, and some of us did, suspect or even see that there would be a comeuppance as early as 2001. The elapsed time between 2001 and 2008 was not, as it seems arithmetically, seven or eight years. In, <laughs> in the years of a Wall Street career, that was about 50 years. Time moved very slowly. So uh, uh, one perhaps forward-looking lesson is that these things can and do go on and on and on. Absurdity piles upon absurdity, and uh, 
non sequitur upon non sequitur, and humiliation upon humiliation for those who have their money up and who lose it because they were really slash wrong. Uh, but uh, yeah, whatever you ask, Liz, that's the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there is a man sitting up here who is uh, almost one of a kind, uh, and we used to constantly call him when I was at CNBC when we needed a bear because there were too few bears at the time, and that's David Tice. David, uh, thank you for helping to fund this movie. I, I'm very interested to know how it came to your attention and why you felt it important to help out with Tom and Jimmy. Well, I cannot exactly remember meeting Jimmy, but this, Jimmy, I think you were 26, weren't you? Yeah. And uh, so he had this story and he was a believer in the Austrian school, and he'd already nailed down Tom Woods, and I was a big believer in Tom Woods. And I had been such a student of the Austrian school, and as, as you kindly pointed out, Liz, I had been talking about the Austrian school in the bubble yeah. back in 97, 98, 99, because I'd started my Prudent Bear Fund in 1996. People thought I was crazy, because, but that was when Alan Greenspan made his famous irrational exuberant speech. And so I could only keep from pulling out my hair at that point, understanding what caused stock prices to levitate in 97, 98, 99, when I understood that it was this asset inflation due to excessive credit creation. So frankly, I became a disciple of the Austrian school. I wanted the, the Austrian school to be understood. And when Jimmy came to me and saying, I want to have it understood, you know, it spoke to me. And Jimmy, again, hats off to you for making this such a great educational film. And I think everybody in the audience, I'd like you guys to become disciples of the Austrian school and inform other people. Because whenever I meet an economics student, I want to inform them about how important the Austrian school of economics is. Um, before we get, and we're, what we're going to do is we're going to whip through a bunch of questions with, with everybody up here. And yes, you have to stay till the end simply because, A, we're going to open it up to questions if that's okay. So be, be garnering your questions and getting those together. But B, we're going to spin it forward. What bubbles do they see up here now? But before we get to that, Tom, I wanted to ask you how you looked at this massive pile of clips and this group of people and how and what challenges you faced in putting the script together? Oh, well, thank goodness the fast bulk was done by Jim. I was the elder statesman of the project. <laughs> had the big picture view, the big picture view. It's very easy to paint, um, but Jimmy slogged through all this material. And yet, there were certain, certain bits and pieces that we all knew, those of us who followed the crisis closely, we all knew had to be in there. We had to have Peter being not just criticized, but literally laughed at. Because at that moment, Peter couldn't realize how awesome that moment is for the future. Because these SOBs laughed at you, and you were so right, and then almost nobody apologized to you later. I mean, it tells you something about these people. Ben, ben Stein did. I, I know, that, yeah, that's right, Ben Stein did. That's right, he did, and, and I, I give him credit for that. But these people, it's like they didn't even pause for a breath they had been completely refuted in every way possible, and they just kept on talking, you know? you know. Whereas you would think that a few of them would retire to a monastery for five years to be <laughs> silent to do penance or something. It never happens. Uh, so we knew that there were certain things that had to go in there. Or you have to love the, the sequence of quotations from Ben Bernanke, in which he resolutely denies he's printing money, which is just a, a nitpicking distinction anyway. And the effect is as if he's printing money, as he later concedes himself. So to, to include, to, so in other words, there were some greatest hits that those of us who followed this so closely knew that just had, had to make it in there. And then the question becomes, who are the people who need to be interviewed? And then, you know, you can offer the entire interviews as a bonus, but the, the key people, who are the key people who have to be featured in that thing? And once you talk to those people, the gems and the gold nuggets just, just come automatically. You know, when, when you specifically look at interest rates, right now we're currently, for Fed funds rates, at two and a quarter to two and a half percent. That's pretty darn low. And I want to know right now, how is it that people can look at one thing? Remember this thing recently on the, that broke the internet where do you see the dress is red or is the dress blue? 
or black and red or something. And, and there were people 100% sure that it was red and others looked at the same picture and they saw it as blue. How is it that everybody up here sees interest rates one way and then the rest of the world saw it differently? Gene, how, do you, how do you view <laughs> low interest rates and where we are right now? Wow. <laughs> okay, that's a tough question. Uh, well, the, the, the puzzle with that is, is that uh, we know that the Fed, of course, is a, look, a, it's a Soviet-style planning of the credit markets. Uh, you know, fix the, especially fix the, the short-term price, fix the long-term price. Uh, we, we, we don't quite know uh, where the market interest rate would be uh, if the markets were allowed to operate. And so that's always the puzzle. I will also say that uh, that while uh, in the case of the uh, of, of the uh, uh, Great Recession, uh, we knew what was happening. We knew that that uh, that that disaster was building. But if we look back on uh, on, on the history of the last seventy years, uh, it, it's difficult to be able to have been able to predict whether a particular downturn was going to lead to a 10% unemployment rate or to a 6% unemployment rate. And so uh, it, it's difficult, even with the benefit of hindsight, to explain why uh, we had the great moderation for a while uh, and why that ended with the housing bubble, why, why the, uh, the previous recession that was most severe was in 81, 82. Uh, we could, it, it, I mean, we can sort of invent reasons for it, but in a way we're cheating with the benefit of 74, 75, another severe recession. Then a moderation, now a, now a severe recession in 08. So clearly uh, the storm clouds are building. Uh, the most reliable indicator of, uh, of pending a recession is the yield curve, the inverted yield curve, if the, the short-term interest rate is higher than, than the 10-year, than the through three-month three interest rates versus 10-year, for example. And that's beginning to form. So we see that happening. Uh, and so there is cause for worry. Uh, and, but I hate to be completely doom and gloom. I want to emphasize one thing about this movie and the importance of it. Uh, when, when, when we begin to puzzle over why the popularity of Bernie Sanders, why the popularity of socialism, why the millennials talk in those terms, it may very well be primarily because of what happened in 08, 09. Because they, because they saw what was happening to their parents' homes. They came onto the job market in, in 2010, 2011. Uh, they, uh, they came uh, into the economy when the slowest uh, expansion on record was, uh, was occurring from 10% unemployment rates. So they got traumatized by what occurred. And they lost faith in capitalism. And they lost faith in capitalism because movies like The Big Short are being uh, put out, because books like The Big Short, because there is a movie called uh, Inside Job that won an Academy Award. And when the guy who won the Academy Award uh, said uh, at, uh, in Hollywood, do you know that not a single person has been indicted? Well, the first person to indict would be Bill Clinton. But that was not in his movie. And, it, and I think this film was even shown here. And I asked him from the floor, how can you whitewash Barney Frank? That was the only question yeah. I got. But the point is this that This film were, did not whitewash there, Barney well, Frank. Well, it did not. But there, but there was a lot out there, and this movie is fighting it. I'll tell you one other thing I wanted to mention, which is unusual, because it's all about something to do with the Trump administration. The, the Federal Housing Finance Authority, which is in charge of Fannie and Freddie and, and federal housing, they, they've been giving, putting out research that's incredible that I made use of, uh, showing that, uh, that, that the government was primarily involved in what went on through the 90s into 2002, 2003, and then that's when the private sector came in, when they were looking at 10, 12, 13 percent uh, uh, house prices. And now the head of FHFA is a guy named Mark Calabria, appointed by Trump. Mark Calabria wrote four book reviews for me at Barron's. He was at Cato. He's a very sophisticated free market guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagine putting Tom Woods head of FHFA and you almost have the picture, or, uh, or Peter Schiff. It's almost that extreme. So I, I, what's happening there is amazing, but they have a free market guy in charge of the regulatory agency, and, and that Mark Calabria believes that Fannie and Freddie should, should be shut yeah, down. Yeah. And they're sitting on top of the data. So there is hope that we can get the word out about what really is causing the problems in American capitalism, the government, not capitalism itself. That was a part of the problem, is that we... Yeah. We've rebuilt an entire system instead of fixing the crack foundation. And Peter, again, to, to the point about how you envision 
low rates and where we are right now. Uh, you look through a different prism than most everybody else. Well, as you know, the movie explained, I mean, low rights, rates are great if they are the result of the free market. If you have an abundance of savings, uh, you can have low rates. But if you don't, then you need to have higher rates. And you know, when the government fixes prices, uh, it creates problems. And you know, the housing bubble was the result of Greenspan lowering interest rates to 1% and keeping them there for a couple of years and then slowly raising them back up to five and a half, wherever they got. And during those years of artificially low rates, we inflated so large a bubble that when it popped, we had the financial crisis and the worst recession since the Great Depression. Now, think about what's in store for us because after that bubble popped, instead of learning their lessons, after having blown two bubbles, first in the stock market and then in the real estate market, uh, instead of you know, admitting that they lit the fires that they're trying to put out, the Federal Reserve didn't lower interest rates to 1%, they lowered them to zero. And they left them there for six, seven years. And then they took three more years to get back up to two, and they're already going back down. In July, the Fed is going to start cutting rates again. So if we created such a big bubble with 1% rates for a couple of years that resulted in the, o in the 08 financial crisis, what is going to result from this? If we made all those mistakes with 1%, we made even more mistakes with zero. So the misallocations of resources, the malinvestments, the, everything is so much worse. So the U.S. economy today stands on the precipice of a far greater crisis than the one we experienced in 08. And I think the big difference is there's no more bailouts. They're going to try the same thing again, Liz. They're going to try to they're going to try QE4. They're going to go back down to zero, but they're not going to blow up another asset bubble. They're going to finally crush the dollar and then we're going to get that inflation that we should have got uh, the first time around, only it's going to be much worse. Jim Grant, what is the worst thing you see policymakers doing right now? that will trigger the next bubble explosion? You know, this, I think showing up for work. <laughs> <laughs> in, in fairness to the human record, uh, 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 following years, uh, I uh, will give you, uh, uh, in anticipation of a point that I'll get around to in uh, 45 or 50 minutes. All right, here they are. Uh, 18, uh, 19, 18, uh, 26, 1837, 1847, 1857, 1866, uh, 1877, 1890. Uh, those were years of extreme financial difficulties in a century in which there was no Federal Reserve. And uh, the longer I'm in this business, which is now a very long time, the more I become persuaded that money is simply not humanity's best subject. And certainly, uh, governments don't help, nor uh, fundamentally perhaps does the fractional reserve banking system help, although it certainly has been useful in many ways. But before we blame everything on Ben Esperanti, PhD, or his uh, fellow practitioners or malpractitioners elsewhere, I think we ought to at least acknowledge uh, that error is part and parcel of getting up in the morning. What is interesting is the clustering of error in finance. Somebody in this fine movie pointed out that, uh, uh, that iron ore makers generally don't suffer runs on their businesses. So it's something about finance. Mm. Um, and Liz, I would say that uh, apropos of the efficient markets doctrine and the uh, proposition that uh, uh, the markets, if left unmolested, will give us the uh, define an exact outcome that uh, mathematics would anticipate. In answer to that, I would say that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, people around money are just as efficient as they are around romance. <laughs> uh, uh, that, uh, so anyway, that, that is uh, uh, by way of citing perhaps a slightly alternative point of emphasis on who done it. Uh, uh, Morgan Stanley went hat in hand along with seven or eight other uh, bad actors to Hank Boston to get uh, infused with your money in 2008. None of them, not all of them were principally in the housing business. The, the credit crisis was a crisis of extreme
extreme over leverage and court judgment that was just infused. And, and the source of that was, I think, to a degree, uh, central banks, and uh, to a degree, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. David Tice, I, I really want your answer on this. What do you think is the worst thing that policymakers or even the gamblers out there at the big financial companies or even just regular people, because you know some people out there absolutely deserve some of the guilt in all of this because they were the ones who did not read the fine print. But what do you see as really barreling toward the next big crisis? Well, I think as Peter talked about, it has to do with this next bubble. How are we going to get out of it? And there's confidence in central banks. And when the confidence in central banks ebbs, then that's when we're going to be in trouble. And right now, the central banks don't have many bullets left in the gun because, as Peter mentioned, we're about ready to start cutting rates. And so we have this next economic decline after interest rates are at for $13 trillion at negative levels. What the heck are we going to do? And that's when we're going to go to gold, in my opinion, because there is this confidence in central banks that isn't going to be there anymore. There's not going to be any more uh, bullets in the gun, and so look out. Jimmy and Tom, you're working on the current movie, but I almost feel, because this story hasn't played out entirely, I almost feel you have to wait. Because what is ironic is during, during the election and during the campaign, Donald Trump had said, and we, we have it on tape and we've aired it a couple of times on Fox Business during my show, 3 p.m. Eastern on the Fox Business Network. Uh, uh, <laughs> he said that President Obama kept rates artificially low for political reasons, and this was just a shame and a crime. And uh, imagine that we are right now seeing the exact same thing where he is even much more obvious in bullying the Federal Reserve to cut rates and to keep them low. And it, it's quite obvious in many cases where you see him trying to set up blame if something goes wrong and say that, oh, the Fed raised rates too quickly and too many times. Um, now he's just like President Obama in that he's pushing for low rates, although possibly for different reasons. It's interesting that one of Paul Krugman's most recent columns has Krugman saying that you can actually make a case for preemptively lowering rates right now to try to stave off a, a coming downturn. But we got to screw Trump. We got to just we can't give it to him. give it to him because we can't let him get away with bullying the Fed. We'd rather have the crisis come than to let uh, Trump get what he wants. But you know, you know you're, you're certainly right that this is a kind of an un, this is a continuing story. But in a way, World War II is a continuing story of World War One, but you still need the documentary about World War One, And likewise for this, the concern is that everybody gets the narrative wrong about 08, so that when the next one comes in 20, 21, whenever, if they use 08 and their false understanding of it as a basis for policy in 2020, 2021, it's just disaster. I mean, there's still, Bernanke is using his faulty understanding of the Great Depression to justify the wild policies of, of uh, 08 and 09, and, and the future, and likewise, there are Keynesians who use their misunderstanding. Of the group. So the Great Depression is just a, a is a is a fall is, is has yielded a completely wrong narrative in the minds of almost anybody with any influence anywhere. So and that's how many decades ago. So it's it's so critical to get this particular episode correct in our minds because we're all still alive. Those of us who lived through it, we're all still here, and just cannot allow a false narrative about it to ossify the way it has about the Great Depression, because that has yielded that and the idea that World War II got us out of the Great Depression. Well, that justifies fiscal stimulus from now until forever, because look, it worked, worked in World War II. You just can't smash this stuff hard enough. And as I say, given that we lived through it recently, uh, now is the time to strike at these people. Jimmy? Yeah. Let me let Jimmy and then Peter. Uh, just, just to add to kind of where we cut off the movie, you know, it, it does kind of seem like, okay, you're making a movie about the housing bubble, but you don't even get into the bailouts. Um, but I'm not going to say I planned this out years ago, but when we split the movie into two, uh, where we split it was very intentional. 
And with the Austrian School of Economics, they really focus on the run-up being the problem, and that's the cause, not how we respond to the crash. The way we respond is just uh, something that delays uh, the correction and makes it longer and worse. Um, so uh, basically, the other school of, schools of economics, like Keynesians and monetarists, they really believe that it, it's that response. So this is my ultimate way of saying, screw you, Paul Krugman, that like, I'm going to make an entire <laughs> movie about the housing bubble, and it's not even going to get into 2008. Peter, you wanted to weigh in? Yeah. You know, um, the, the, the bigger problem uh, politically, you know, you're, you're right. I mean, Donald Trump has become everything he criticized to, to be elected. I mean, most Republicans would never have voted for him in the primary if he, he told them what he was going to do. Um, but, you know, he got elected because he leveled with the public that we had a phony recovery created by cheap money, that we had a big, fat, ugly stock market bubble, and that we were hiding behind uh, fabricated government statistics that purported to tell us everything was great, like the official unemployment numbers, but they were all a fraud, a con, or a hoax. And then he was going to come in and drain the swamp, and we were going to have a real economy, and we were going to have real economic growth. But then when he gets elected president, he realizes that politically that's very difficult to do because now you have to cut government spending, uh, you know, you have to allow interest rates to go up, it means the stock market's going to go down, I mean, you know, it means a lot of people are going to be unhappy. So what Trump wanted the minute he was elected was another phony economy, just like the one that Obama enjoyed. So he wants to hide behind the same phony statistics. Now they're real. He wants more cheap money. He wants a bigger bubble. But the real danger now, since Trump has now claimed that he has made America great again by embracing capitalism, by cutting taxes and deregulating, and now we have this great economy, the best in the history of America, yeah. right? But now this whole thing is going to blow up, and who's going to get blamed? Capitalism once again, right? Uh, and now it's not just Barack Obama that's waiting in the rings, it's socialism. We are at the point where America is going to completely reject capitalism based on the sins of government, but not understanding it. And the savior that they're going to see is going to be to go all in on socialism. And so that is the, the danger and why this next crisis is going to be so much worse. And of course, they're all convinced that what we did in, in 2008 worked. So if it worked, we're going to do it again. But the fact that we have to go back to zero, the fact that we're going to have to do QE again, is proof that it didn't work the last time. Because the, what they told us the first time was that this is temporary. Right? This is an emergency measure. Remember what Ben Bernanke first told Congress, we're not monetizing the debt. This is only temporary. We're going to sell the bonds. This is from, from QE1. Uh, and so the fact that they were never able to normalize rates, that they were never able to shrink their balance sheet, proves that the policies failed, yet they are going to do them again, except now we're going to be doing it with a socialist administration that's also going on to print money to, to finance a laundry list of government programs. Uh, and so, you know, th we're, we're headed for, you know, something much, much worse. Um, you know, black swan, you guys know that term. It's, it's sort of the unseen disaster that's coming. They're, black swans are hard to see because they're dark and you can't really see them. Peter, what do you think is going to trigger this next, or at least be the straw that breaks the camel's back to this next disaster you foresee? Well, I mean, what I think is going to happen this time, and everybody just, you know, wants to fight the last war. Uh, and, and so they think, oh, the Fed's going to be able to, uh, you know, get us out of this by printing more money and, and lowering rates. But I think it's going to backfire on them because I think when the Fed has to start cutting rates, I think rates are going to rise on okay, the long end. Gonna trigger well, that's going to be it. It's gonna, <coughs> interest rates are going to rise. They're not going to fall. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see a breakout in consumer prices, not asset prices. And we're going to have the same stagflation that surprised the Keynesians in the 1970s, right? They thought it was impossible, but it happened. We're going to have a weak economy, but with rising long-term interest rates and rising consumer prices, and there's nothing they can do about it. And when the markets get a whiff of this, when they realize that, hey, you know, it's not 2% inflation. And in the movie, we talk about how, you know, they said that the Fed said we can't have falling prices. We want stable prices. Well, then we said, no, we don't want stable prices, or we want to have, make sure we have inflation of less than 2%. That was the ceiling. Then it became a target. Now it's a floor. Right Now we have to have inflation above 2%. But once it's 3%, 4%, 5%, and the market senses this, and they see there's no control, because Greenspan, I mean, um, um, Volcker let interest rates go up to 20%. 
and we had a very bad recession as a result of that. Imagine the recession we would have if the Fed stood back and let interest rates go to where they need to go with the amount of debt we have now at the federal level, at the individual level, at the corporate level, at the state level. So the, 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 we're in this box where if we do the right thing to, like, like Volcker did, then everything implodes. And if we're too afraid to do that, then we have hyperinflation. So that's going to be the trigger when, when, when we get the recession, but we don't get the reaction. When, the gov when they put the monetary stimulus and it doesn't produce the same reaction, in instead it's an overdose right. on that stimulus. And, 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 then, then it's, and then it's game over. Then it's checkmate for the Fed, and then we got to pay the piper. Uh, Gene, what do you see as, I know, that's a, you guys are all going to leave here tonight. <laughs> thinking, Oy vey. Um, but tell me, Gene, what you see, and then David, I'll get your opinion on what, what is the black swan? I'm always interested in, and by the way, the last trigger is not going to be this trigger. Uh, well, uh, I, 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 I do think that we're headed for recession, as I've said. I, I want to just add to what Peter said, that, that when it, we do have a, a housing bubble again, but uh, by any measure, it's not as much of a bubble as we had in 04 and 05. We do have a stock market bubble. By any measure, it's not as bad as it was in 2000, 2001. So where we can measure those bubbles, uh, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, it's not as bad. It's a mystery in the sense of where is, where is the collapse, where is the bubble forming, where is the malinvestment. Uh, in terms of conventional measures, we don't find it uh, nearly so bad in the housing or in the stock market, which are usually uh, the two biggest uh, suspects. Uh, we do, as I say, uh, we are moving toward an inverted yield curve. That's bad. We don't can, can know. Can we just stop for a minute? Well, I don't assume sure. that everybody in this audience sure. knows what uh, an inverted well, yield curve. Well, I just curve. defined it before. It's a. It's a th just measured simply the three-month Treasury uh, rate. Which higher, are shorter term. The short term. That's three months higher than the ten-year, as I've said, uh, and so that's. But, but what? Just sorry yeah, to push this, but. Yeah, sure. What is inferred from that yeah. is that people are pouring money yeah. into the shorter term because they cannot see longer term, yeah. and that's a scary yeah. prospect. And when you see that inversion where the shorter term uh, treasuries return higher uh, interest rates, that often precedes, not always, but often precedes Well, it's, it's almost an always, uh, because as a matter of fact, this is where I want to make the point that, that you hear economists say, saying that, well, when it, whenever the stock market, you know, it, it, it gets back to the only good quip that Paul Samuelson ever made, which is the stock market has predicted nine out of the last five recessions. <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that almost every indicator is a false positive. I hate that term. I think just false alarm. Mm -hmm. Almost every indicator uh, does precede recession, but it's filled with false alarm. Yeah, the I, one I, I, that I, is not, if I may finish, Peter, you had a lot of chance. Forgive me. If I may finish, the one that is not is the inverted yield curve. The inverted yield curve is actually almost any time it happens, a recession occurs. So that's why I keep mentioning mentioning it. But I only want to point out, uh, uh, in terms of what Peter said, is that uh, we not only had the 1% uh, Fed funds rate, we had a very active Fannie and Freddie pretty much acting like a central bank. And while they are while they are uh, mischievous. Now, they're not as bad as they had been. So I think it's a little bit mixed as to what we're going to be headed for, whether it's going to be as bad as we said. But I want to ask Peter a question. After this debacle, Peter, the socialists come in. Uh, the, uh, the, the, we got 20 percent uh, uh, unemployment. Where's the light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, what's going to happen uh, 30 years uh, from now to your grandchildren and mine? I don't know. It's a long tunnel. Well, it's a long tunnel, um, but, but I mean, you, you, you have a you crystal ball gets cloudy after that. We only you only see well, it's the, the hell Look, on earth. Is it's, that it? It's tough when you're a democracy. You know that's going to be that's going to be a problem. But well, I wanted to point happen? out, you know, it's first of all, the stock market bubble is a lot bigger than than you think. I mean, there's okay. a lot going on in the stock market. There's a lot of and there's a lot of uh, companies that aren't even publicly traded yeah. that are part of the bubble now yeah. that weren't around then. Uh, the real estate bubble, I think, is much bigger. But your the biggest bubble of them all is the bond bubble. And that is a huge bubble, and it's not just mortgage debt, it's sovereign debt, it's, it's government debt. Uh, so this, this is by far a bigger bubble than the 08 bubble and the 2000 bubble combined. Um, and, and, and we have much more debt than we've ever had, and, we, and it's it financed to a, to a, to a greater degree with, with shorter term money. Uh, so it, it, it's much it's much worse now. So I think you're 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 minimizing the problem by saying it's not as big. It, it's 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 far bigger. But the the only hope that we probably have is if it hits the fan, if we end up in recession, 
uh, before the 2020 election, which is pretty pretty high probability. Trump's not going to get reelected. We're going to have a socialist, and then and then it's going to go from bad to horrible very quickly uh, when the socialists come in. Uh, I w- I've been saying for a long time, you know, when Trump was elected, people were saying, "Hey, he's he's the next Reagan." I said, "No, he's the next Jimmy Carter. He he's gonna, he's the the um, the, uh, the the opposite party." You know, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter was a bridge between uh, the Rockefeller Republicans, Nixon, and then uh, Ronald Reagan, which was a big move to the right. And so I think that Trump is the same thing, bridging between two le- Democrats where they go hard left. But I think the economy is going to be so bad by 2024 if this happens uh, that maybe that'll be our shot to try to uh, get the public to vote for real change, to try to get them to see just how bad government is in all its glory, and, and, and maybe we'll have one last chance to bring the country okay. back. Um, and we're going to open it to questions because we have to clear out of here. In, is it 15 minutes? Yeah, in about t- uh, 12 minutes. So, David, I want to just quickly ask you, um, we've got a whole audience here who may be believing what everybody up here is, is predicting. You're a big investor. <coughs> Tell me what you're doing if this is truly going to come to pass, and what should people do to protect themselves and their money? Well, I think you need to be cautious. I believe in put options at this point with uh, the VIX being at relatively low level. VIX is the volatility or fear index. You know, given how much money can be made from asymmetric returns in that area, I believe gold and silver ought to be 15 to 20 percent of one's portfolio. I think one should be invested in Bitcoin as well, even though it sounds crazy to a lot of us fundamentalist investors. I know Peter's not a fan, but believe that, you know, there's something there and it is a uh, resort against fiat money and therefore some gold and some Bitcoin make some sense. Uh, And so I'd say be hedged, but it's possible we could still be up another, you know, 15 percent in a blow off top. And, you know, I've been wrong before on that, and I'm not going to dismiss the fact that that could happen again. Right. right. You know, sometimes it may, they sometimes say this on Wall Street, that being early is, is just as bad as being late. But, you know, my father, the great surgeon, Dr. Morris Clayman, urologist, not a great investor, um, used to say, Liz, the only difference between salad and garbage is timing. <laughs> um, but you can certainly prepare, right? Uh, okay, I want to open it quickly to questions. My only request is that you say your name. If you have to direct it to a certain person here, that's fine, but make it a question and not a statement. Yeah, can we get a microphone over to Hello, thank you, uh, Barry Cohn. And uh, I wanted to thank you for the piece on the FDIC, because I think that's really relevant uh, a lot of what's happened in the banking system has led to larger banks too big to fail and all that sort of stuff. And so I'd like to ask the panel a little bit about what they think about the indexing phenomenon. And to me, a little bit of one of the, we're, we may even be seeing the cracks in the facade with what's going on with the H2O debacle that's happening right now. We're seeing a little bit of a run on some funds. Uh, do you see that this is something that yeah, well, I mean, indexing, I think, is going to be a big problem, and it's, you know, it's self-perpetuating on the way up. Uh, you know, people buy the most overpriced assets that dominate the indexes. The indexes go up. Oh, those are great returns. More money goes into the index funds, which is recycled back into the same overpriced stocks, and then the value investors throw up their hands. You know, they don't have to, because they can't compete uh, with the momentum in these index funds, and so everything is great on the way up. And, but when the market implodes, these things are just going to collapse. And, you know, the losses are going to be, you know, I- incredible uh, on the way down because there's no real value in these overpriced stocks. The natural buyers are much, much lower. And, uh, you know. Jim, do you want to you also answer that? Or? Uh, there's, there's a indexation phenomenon in the bond market as well. And uh, what happens there is that the, the more indebted or encumbered is the issuer of debt, uh, the bigger position that issuer takes in the index. So uh, uh, it stands to reason there's kind of a, a reverse selection in a bond index that's not really present in the stock. And if you at least make the point that uh, um, 
uh, that the bigger capitalized stocks are perhaps uh, stronger companies or more adaptive or more inventive. Uh, but there's nothing especially inherently desirable about a more indebted Portugal or Iceland than the previously less indebted one, and yet the more debt, the bigger the bottom of the index. So uh, there is a, a very, the, 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 the basic bond index in the world is the, is the uh, Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Index. And uh, many, many investors in the fixed income world are tethered to this. And, uh, and that's one reason that explains the otherwise inexplicable seeming popularity of bonds that yield you less than nothing. It's I mean, you've got German uh, government bonds that are negative yields. So, I mean, you're actually... German, you've got Portuguese treasury bills maturing next May that are priced mm -hmm. to deliver minus 35 basis points, or one-third of a percent. So you pay... Portugal for the privilege of lending. Yeah, I mean, to it's crazy. Portugal, and and that again, that's happening in Germany, and I believe well, JGB Germany, Germany, just, and kind of yeah, yeah, but Switzerland maybe, but <laughs> right. A, that's the least. Germany's the least of it. But it's, Any well, other this questions? Is a much bigger bubble. I, I see a hand way up there. <laughs> can you can you speak a little bit more loud? Sure, sure. Greg, January, Tony Scott. I'm sure both people on the uh, day and, uh, and subscribe to uh, Mr. Grant's interest rate. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Three culprits that I didn't see in the film on the housing crisis. AIG and the subsidiary that all of the banks and broker dealers you know, did their credit to full swap insurance just was underfunded because of regulatory arb arbitrage. That you know, is not because of cheap money or, um, uh, you know, government problems. That was just lack of, you know, smart regulation. S second culprit, you know, Mozilla at Countrywide Credit. You know, he was making so much money, he just kind of seduced an abdication of risk management <coughs> on the part of a lot of the banks and broker dealers that just kind of followed him over the cliff. That's depravity of human nature, not necessarily government and cheap money. And then the third culprit, when I was an NYU student uh, not too far from here, broker dealers could operate only on 10 to 1 leverage. When Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, it was 30 to 1. So somebody at Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers lobbied the government to be able to operate on 30 to 1 leverage. Okay, so the question is? Well, well, <laughs> is it cheap money and government malfeasance, or is it just depravity of human nature and, and lack of good regulation with, with teeth? Well, let, uh, yeah. Uh, let, 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 may I? Okay, okay. Uh, can I jump in? Of course, uh, Jim go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I honestly, I, I have an immense amount of respect for uh, Jim Grant, but I, I heard him say that it's original sin a little bit. You know, I, 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 you know the banker we love to hate was the SOB and the starch collar who would not give you the mortgage because your character, your credit, your quality was not good. You know, the, 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 those bankers were the bastards who would not give people mortgages. That's the banker that the left wing used to hate. Now, without any, uh, you know, uh, further ado, they suddenly depict all the bankers as banksters, casino capitalists. You mentioned Angelo Mazzillo. Angelo Mazzillo was not a mortgage broker. He was a a trust fund baby of Fannie and Freddie. All he did was issue mortgages and Fannie and Freddie would buy them. Uh, so the worst get on top. The casino capitalists get on top when you have a government cheering them on. When you have a government in the, in the 1990s that is causing house prices to go to 10, 11 percent. That is, that when you have George Bush saying that you will give you the, the down payment. And, uh, and, and then, uh, then when, when the prices are going up 10, 11 percent, the casino capitalists get on the bandwagon and they can make a fortune. The starch color guy gets shunted aside. And so please understand that that's the atmosphere that's created. Angelo Mazzillo was given an award at Harvard. Now, uh, in, in 2003, this housing uh, 
organization of Harvard, basically a bunch of academicians who like jobs in government. They gave him an award, and Angela Mazzillo literally said at that meeting, do you know that four out of five of the mortgages we're issuing to poor people are being paid off? Do you know what Angela Mazzillo told those geniuses at Harvard? We've got a 20% default rate. Do you know what any idiot who knows how to figure out mortgage rates could have told him? Then you have very underpriced mortgages. You cannot possibly cover your 20% default rate. That's not what the Harvard guy said. They cheered him. Those people are not capitalists. Those are the worst that get on top. That's really what you're talking about. And I, I'm very mindful of time, and we do have to end this. However, yeah. you can accost all of these people on the way out. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to thank uh, David Tice and, and Tom and Jimmy and everybody up here for really doing a public service here and writing the history that is not yet finished, unfortunately. But nobody, nobody jump off the curve, you know, when, when we get out of here. It's a great... <laughs> Great country, we'll figure it out hopefully. But thank you all so much, and thanks to the Angelica.